I want to pick up. I think it might have gone over this the other day, but I want to pick up on 219. I think we left off with Johnson talking to George on 213 about what it means to be a Londoner. Um, and what kind of men London produces. If you remember, they, they had the little battle when they'd gone to save the Queen of Time. She wasn't there. But George and the Clocker and Johnson battled some dragons and such. And Johnson got half of his face essentially blasted away. And 219, Johnson stops George and says before George leaves, I know you go with a heavy heart to face an unpleasurable and frightening duty, but heavy though your heart be, you find enough space in it to carry a little hope. For the natural flight of the human mind is from hope to hope, and it is in making those great leaps that we most extend our humanity. And heroes, as you have seen from the exertions of this cat, he holds Hodge up, heroes come in all shapes and sizes. Godspeed, boy. Okay, And we didn't talk about it, but... You know, after Edie frees the raven from its bondage to John D to the walker, the raven, although in, in, in slightly different ways, the raven kind of behaves for Edie like Hodge did for Johnson, or Hodge did for George in that battle. I mean, the, the raven acts heroically as much as a raven can. All right? And she and the raven go off. They go back in time. And she sees a lot. She sees her father. She remembers, you know, what it's like being uh, a child. There's the scene when her father gets off work at... Um, what was the name of that place? I shared this a couple of years ago. Um, Smithfield. And she touches a stone on the ground and experiences a tremendous amount of death. And one of the guys says something about her going all weird because she mentions ghosts and he says, well, you know, that kind of fits because she's where she's touching the ground is, we're told, the Charter House Pit. Well, the Charter House Pit, back in the Middle Ages, was a huge burial pit during the time of the plague. Okay? So we're going on, and we're going to pick up, I think it is, yeah, with chapter 36. Um, George still has his third duel. Okay? His third battle to fight against the Connecticut Guild. And he's told, or he remembers, at the beginning of that chapter, what the Sphinx has said. Take the way of the dragon, and by the knight of wood, who lies all alone, you may find kin you can call your own. Find your kin, and within the hour, the dead stone's tongue will be in your power. Well, knight of the wood is St. John's Wood, which is a place in North London. So he's got to go down, and... Page 266. George cries out, calls out Edie's name. And the queen asks, why did you shout Edie? George, did I? I, I, I don't remember. Okay. And he says, that's it. He gasped as he put his hand on the scarred stone lintel and looked over the edge. They're standing on a bridge. That's what? George was smiling as he turned and pointed behind him. The mirror sleeps on a bed where I felt it before. God, I'm stupid. It's there. What? What? The riverbed. The mirror sleeps on the riverbed. Neither here nor there, not beneath the ground nor under the air. It cannot be seen because it's underwater. But I felt it there. First time Edie and I were in the water, I did. I felt something dark out there in the center of the river. It was pulling at me like a sort of magnet. I'm so stupid. Okay. Was what he has to do. He has to get that mirror somehow. So the mirrors just stayed on the ice, said the queen. And when the ice melted, 
He felt the same dark pull from the center of the river, the one he had thought was a tide, but that he now knew was the pull of the darkness in the black mirrors. Okay? He's, and the queen says, all I can feel is a stone hand gripping my wrist too hard. And George lets her go. So she tells George, take her chariot. Why? Because he still has to do that battle. And Edie, beginning in the next chapter, says, George, okay, what? You said George, did I? Well, she says George at the same moment George says Edie. Why? They're different times, same place, essentially. And Edie sees her mother. She turns into a little alcove on the bridge. Someone waiting for her, youngish man, about the same age. And skip to 272. She's pregnant, freaked her out. Freaked her out so much she went off and had an affair with someone else. Said it won't happen again, but this is the man Edie's mom is speaking to. He shrugged, shook his head, unable to find the words. Teacher said Edie's mom. Can't. It's worse than that. I feel terrible. I'm going to do something terrible. How terrible? I'm going to forgive her. Something in the way his voice dropped made the declaration sound like an apology. What? Yeah. She's having a kid. My kid. And she's, you know, I don't think she'll be much of a mom. He'll need someone who, right, timing's right. What did you want to say? He says to her. She squared her shoulders. Not important. That is, forget about it. Say something, Sue. Swear at me. Tell me I'm a complete what? You're not. You're a good guy. You're, you're being a good guy. He is saying he's going to stay with the woman who's cheated on him, gotten pregnant by some other guy. So why does it feel so bad? Okay. She, st she stands, looks out at the river. She says, you know, I've always liked it here. I want to escape all that water. Pulls you, doesn't it? Notice she feels almost like jumping in. She picked up the empty bottle, and as she did so, Edie felt a surge of heat in her pocket. Page 274 at the bottom. She reached in, pulled out her heartstone. It was blazing light, but only around the edges, outlining it. She felt it humming in her hand. Somehow she knew it's not a warning sign. Then she looked at the glass bottle in her mother's hand. We should put a message in the bottle. Send it out to sea. Oh, my God, said Edie. What? Edie just pointed, outlined in light on the bottle, was an identical shape to the irregular disc shape of the glass in her hand. Glass, the exact same color as the bottle. Bloody hell, said the gunner. Edie's heartstone is made from the bottle that her mother is holding. Edie couldn't speak. Her eyes were wet and wide in wonder. Her mother smiled too eagerly, too cheerfully. He looked so sad. His eyes, Edie saw, were very nice when you look closer. His trousers reflect with different colored paint. He's a painter, as were his hands. Maybe he's a house painter. Okay, Let's make it an invisible message. What would you put in it if you could, she said. Hope, love, happiness, she says. One day it'll float up on a beach and someone will think it's empty and not realize it's a magic bottle. So what is in Edie, Edie's heartstone? Hope? Love, happiness, they'll never know, never know what. Never know why their life changes for the better. God bless her and all who sail with her. And what do they do? There's a pulse in the bottle that only Edie saw, a low flash of light. Between the man's hand and the woman, she felt an answering tingle in the glass in her hand. Then her mother took the bottle, launched up and away, and then down, tumbling through the night air to land with an inaudible splash in the river far below. And Edie's mom reaches into her pocket and gives him a key on a ring that had a sort of metal plane dangling from it. 
He nodded, put it in his pocket. She sketched a wave in the air, walked away. If you ever get to the sea one day, I hope you find your bottle. Edie, she liked him. I thought that was why the raven was showing me at this moment. It wasn't. It was the bottle, the bottle that made this. What did Edie miss in that little scene? The keychain. She's seen that keychain before. It's George's. It's George's. Who's the man? George's father. George's father. And? Edie's father. Even though she didn't know what I was going to be born, that's something, eh? Yes, said the gunner, that's something. But he's pretty sure that they're not talking about the same thing. Okay? And Dictionary Johnson meets up with the dragon at Temple Bar, or the page 279, the Temple Bar dragon meets up with Dictionary Johnson. And it opens its mouth, and the railway man, rail, railway man is getting ready to shoot it, and the dragon says, Dictionary, page 280. Of course it talks. Okay. What's the dragon say? 281. Fight, you did. Happy, not, day, bad, time, gone, dark, calling. First dragon am I, to guard city made. Okay. Keep in mind, artists put their intention into the thing that they are making. This dragon says, I'm the first dragon. I'm the main dragon. My intention is to guard the city. This dragon obviously is not a taint, okay? Not made, answer call, one who enslaved city would. Okay? So the dragon says he also fought. And Dictionary invites the dragon to help them. Chapter 39, we get the stone corpse. Joseph goes, goes down to Southwark and Southwark Cathedral. And the corpse, stone corpse, speaks to him. George says, I don't understand. The bell is now tolling. And George's hand flexes in pain, page 293. Corpse, if thy hand causes you to offend, cut it off. What? Gospel of Mark. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell and to the fire that shall never be quenched. Peace be with you. George watches it turn. The knight of wood comes down the aisle and says, there's a chariot at the door. Golden girl, he says, you must go with her. So George goes. Okay. The gunner and Edie, let's skip that chapter. Pick up with the impossible bridge. Page 305, Ariel tells George it's the impossible bridge. That is, it's not a real one. All it requires is a leap of faith. And George thinks of what Dictionary said to him. The natural flight of the human mind is what? Hope. Well, it's kind of like faith. He swallows, this is it, and what does he do? He steps out onto the bridge and says, the moment when I find out who I am, the last possible moment when I can run. It's 306, done running. And he steps out into the air. Okay. Meanwhile, Edie and the gunner fall out of the pub and stuff. Edie tries to save her mother, but she can't. And so Fletcher takes us back and forth between Edie and the gunner and George, and George faces the Dark Knight, 315. I am your worst fear. Will you face me? George felt the vibrations of sound hit him head on as he kept walking forward. He kept going because he knew something the darkness clearly didn't. His worst fear had been about his dad. He had worried that he died, thinking George had meant the last angry words he'd flung at him. 
unaware they were to be their last words, that he died thinking George didn't love him. He lived with the fear that his dad had somehow been responsible, excuse me, that he had somehow been responsible for his dad's death. But he'd faced that fear when he'd stood the gunner's watch on the memorial. He'd faced it, and it had evaporated. So what then is the Dark Knight's, do the Dark Knight's words mean? What is George's worst fear? Nothing. Okay. So he looks into the slit, page 316, of the Dark Knight's helmet, tried to clear his mind as he felt with his hand. The hand tingled. He was feeling for the flaws in the metal, the places the welding was weakest. He felt the heat in his hand radiate through the outer sheets of metal. The knight must have felt it too, because he tries to back up. What are you doing? Using a making hand to mar, like this. And he closes his eyes, and there's the sound of a great invisible host roaring in approval. Unknown to himself, the Dark Knight had ridden with all the knights of the Knickman Guild. The Dark Knight can't back up. He can't retreat, just as George couldn't retreat earlier. The bell tolls. He saw that every battle-hardened face was looking at him, not the Dark Knight, to see if he would stand. What they didn't know was that he had passed the moment when he would let himself run. He'd taken the leap of faith. He braced one leg at an angle behind, beside, behind himself, twisting his hips so that his chest remained head on to the night. Death whistled toward the core of his being, his heart pounding in time. And George is thinking, this is it. And as he faced it, he abruptly stopped feeling alone. He stopped feeling like a lonely boy of 13 summers. He felt older, much older, almost ancient, stronger than any one person could ever be. Why? What did the stone corpse tell him? Well, there's been George Chapman's before. There's a lot of Chapman's. And he's kind of being buttressed by that sense of family, of history. We're told every earlier George, every Chapman, every mother, every father, down the long centuries who had lived before him, they were all somehow standing with him. They're all in this. It was as if that long line of dead men and women had shouted a great yes, and then it was over. His stone arm snapped up, caught the tip of the lance, and we're told the impact and the forward momentum of the horse and rider, rider jarred the breath out of him, jolted him. They slammed him at least 20 feet, but he kept his leg braced, held his footing. And he said, that's it? Now you want to tell me about your fear? In other words, you gave me your best shot. Now let me give you mine. I can feel your fear. You need a shape. You have no form to exist in within our world, so you need a shape. Because without it, you'd be nothing. You know what? George says, I'm not afraid of you. Why should I be afraid of nothing? You are nothing. In other words, George is kind of coming to the realization, I'm a maker. It also means I can be an unmaker. If I can unmake this statue, then you're nothing. No, says George, you're not everything, in reply to the writer. You're just fear and pain and evil. Each of those is what? It's an absence. Fear is an absence of joy. Pain is an absence of health. Evil is an absence of good. And that isn't everything. I mean, it may be where you come from, but not, not here. And George... With that, he bent the tip of the lance into a right angle, jerked the knight, who was trying to backpedal the horse forward right out of the saddle. The bell tolled, the Kinnickman Guild moved as one, engulfing the dark knight, and as the bell continued to toll, George saw them hacking and ripping at the fallen knight. Okay. But now George has got the darkness flowing into his hand. So he still has to take care of that. Walk around the beach. What happened to Edie's mother? Uh, she was trapped inside the shack with her uh, with her stepfather and um, and the walker. And the walker took her heart stone. After that, uh, then she was put into an insane asylum. After that, uh, she died. How? Killed herself. How? She flung herself in the walker off the roof. It jumps off a building. 
Page 330. She died? Said the gunner. She killed herself. Gunner, so why can't you forgive her? Page 331. Because she was meant to look after me. Notice that. Meant. The language Edie's using is the language of making and, and things made. Mothers are supposed to look after their children, as are fathers. But she left me with him. She took the easy way out, left me the hard way. Ow, the raven pecks at her ear. Ow, it does it again. The soldier, the gunner says, no, ravens, raven. Mm -mm. What, is, what is the raven? Memory. In other words, your memory's not right here, Edie. Edie, he doesn't know everything, does he? Well, what did the queen say? Yes, he does. <laughs> he remembers and sees perfectly. The gunner, no, just everything that happened. I think he knows something else which he wants to show you and all. Okay. Uh, skip some more. Skipping a bunch because they have the... Pick up a 348. Go back again. Edie sees her mother with the walker. You have a daughter. Edie's mother goes very still. Does she have a stone? She's not like me. She's just like you. And he talks about old days, mothers handing the knowledge down to their daughters, etc., etc. What's her mother trying to do? Protect Edie. And Edie said, she didn't help me. The walker, I can see it must be painful you now, painful for you now, knowing what you do, that you cannot pass the knowledge on to your daughter. In the old way, you must be sorely vexed that she will go through a wasted life like your own, not knowing what she is, going mad. I'll tell her, no, you're not going to have time. He says, um, your daughter does have a stone. Where is it? Eating my time capsule. I didn't tell her. She doesn't know where it is. He's going to kill her because I didn't tell her. Gunner, not your fault. None of this is your fault. Okay. Skip a bunch again. Matter of death and life, 361. Edie. Edie's mother, excuse me, on the roof. She has gravel in her hand. She's getting ready to throw it. She tells the walker, her name is Edie, and I won't tell you one damn thing that would harm her. Then neither of us will, she says, when he says you will not get off this roof, roof alive. She throws the gavel, gravel at his eyes. And in the moment when he raises his hand, she sprints right at him. All the wear and tear that the years and drink and the worrying that she was mad and put on her fell away and where the long hair flying behind her and fire in her eyes, her face was in this one last moment as fierce and focused as a lioness defending its cub. She looked again like the mother Edie now remembered in her dreams. Edie saw the blade because the walker has a dagger. Saw the blade cut an arc in the air reflecting the rosy light from the setting sun. And then they were gone. Edie and the gunner were left staring at the sun, now a red hole in the sky where her mother had sacrificed herself in taking the walker off the roof. She didn't know that he can't die, said the gunner. You may be born to pull the past from stones and see terrible stuff. Someone your age shouldn't have to see. But there are some images you don't need to carry in your head. In other words, because Edie says, I need to see the body. We really don't. Her mother was spread eagle on the tarmac below, one leg bent under the other, arms wide, almost as if she had been crucified. Why? Why that imagery? Sacrifice. Sacrifice. Her eyes stared sightlessly at the sky above her, and the walker leaves. Edie says, I want to see how it ended. Gunner, you saw how it ended. You saw all that matters. It ended with your mother flying. She flew through the air into the sunset. She was fighting for you. Notice how beautiful this is. You know? 
Just like she fought to bring you safe into this world and gave you your first breath, so she fought for you with her last. She fought to save you from him. She died with nothing in her but that fierce love of you. The gunner's voice was low and raw. And death is a terrible final thing, Edie girl, but there's many worse ways to die than with love in your heart. And that's all you need to know. There's nothing you can see down there that is a truer or finer end than that. And that's the God's honest truth of it. Okay. Edie didn't see her mother spread eagled, crucified, like, it's my right. It's my right. He says, you're right, it is. Just like it is your right not to see her. It is your right to choose whether the last image you carry of her is as a living creature or a dead shell. It's my right. The gunner doesn't say anything else. Neither he nor the raven looked at Edie as she stood there, the wind blowing her hair across her face. She was poised between stepping forward and retreating. And then she just sits down. The Sphinx lied. All this time, I thought this was about finding her alive. I mean, I knew she was dead. Then I found her stone. It stayed lit. Sphinxes don't lie. And if Sphinxes don't lie, then... But I thought she lived. I thought she was alive. I thought, I thought, I thought, she keeps saying. I thought she was alive. I knew it was impossible. I still had this crazy, stupid hope. Page 366. The raven clacked to speak. Gunner says, she is alive, Edie. You know, just look deep within. Those we love never truly leave us. We carry them in us forever. That's not what Edie means. She doesn't need this kind of pablum. Her love will ride in your heart throughout your life, and good Lord. And beyond, Edie, how can it live beyond? That's all magic rubbish. It's not magic, girl, or if it is, it's just the ordinary magic of being human. You'll carry her love and add it to your own. Okay? So, they go back to their London. And we get chapter 50, An Unexpected Ally, page 373. It was a taint, and not just any taint. It was a dragon. And George thinks, oh, great. Rock in a hard place. Okay? It's not any dragon, it's the Temple Bar dragon who shows up and it looks at George and says, 376, George shows its hand, his hand to the dragon and says, thanks, but I thought you were a taint. Dragon bows his head. Dragon, save, city, must, maker, save, city, can. Must means that's what he's charged to do. <coughs> Can means George has a choice. Well, George is kind of like, mm, maybe. <laughs> so, dragon, maker, save. See, the dragon's using logic. I must save the city. You can save the city. Therefore, I will save you. Okay. So George and the dragon go off, um, pick up with, let's see here. Edie comes up behind George, bottom of 381, top of 382. And we're told, Although she knew who he was the moment she laid eyes on, eyes on him, there was something about him that had changed. She couldn't figure out exactly what it was. But he not only looked older, but he seemed to carry himself completely differently, taller, etc. What it was, she realized, was that he was no longer turned in on himself, hunched around an apology for what he was. Even his face looked different. With his hair now pushed back out of his eyes, she had taken such a firm dislike to the regretful boy that she had taken such a firm dislike to so long ago on the parking parking ramp. It was also the look in his eyes. He still looked worried, but it was a capable worry. The worry of someone who's dealing with something bigger than himself. George, Edie, we need you. We've got a dragon, we need you. And he notices Edie now. Raven on her shoulder was one thing, but he'd seen that before. It's, he'd seen the confident stride, the strutting jaw, jutting 
jaw. What he hadn't really seen was the smile. Easy, unforced, almost joy. He asked her what took so long. She says, what happened to your sleeve? George explained about the ambush in the mirror, how they'd been unable to find the mirror, etc. Okay. Um, let's skip the rest of that. Dragon takes on the lions and others. Skip the next chapter. Go to 54, I think. Yep. Chapter 54, Ground Assault. A um, couple of statues come towards George, page 405. Two tall male humanoids. What's the oid mean? Like yeah. human, but not human. Okay, George, they're almost human. Gunner, yeah, that's what makes them angry. Notice what really, what's really the difference between spits and taints? It's the spirit that's either inside them or the lack of spirit. That's not okay. So why are taints so angry? Because they want what the spits have. They're filled with an absence, and they want that absence full. They want to be spits, but they never can be, because they're not made to be spits. Okay? Page 407. Taints get guns, and they start using them. How the hell, the gunner says, do taints know how to use gun, guns, tired, let alone bloody get hold of them? Okay? There's snipers on the roof. They start firing. But the, eye, the eyes that squinted along the gun sights were not the eyes of the soldiers. Those eyes stared sightlessly from the heads that had been torn partially off the bodies and now hung off their necks. Gargoyle heads were stuck on in their place. Snarling stone heads. This is the former Houston mob. The heads have been taken off by the dark and replaced with the heads of gargoyles. So you've got the bodies of spits, <coughs> the brains, so to speak, the wills, so to speak, of taints. Okay. Go on to Last Stand, chapter 58. We're obviously going to be out of here early. So there's a break in the fighting. They, they separate. They come back. 426. George missed the first wave of the attack because he was bent over the Queen of Time, trying to mend her as fast as he could. Exhausting work, he began to realize every time he healed a gash or smoothed out a hole, it took something from him. He was putting himself into his work, literally, bit by bit. Okay? He's got to get her healed because until they get time fixed back on her plinth, they're stuck in this in between place. Okay? George asks the dragon when he pulls, hold on, didn't mark that. The stone corpse had told George, you carry the answer with you, you always have. Sticks his hand in his pocket. And he pulls out the keychain. Then he felt the reassuring jagged edge of the house keys and the smooth, curving elegance of the miniature brass key ring they were attached to. George looks at Edie. She looks at George. They both look at the dragon. George asks the dragon, Do you think if you made one of these it would fly? What it is. Plain. George turns to Edie with a smile. His face, her face was white. She's staring at the key ring, the little brass spitfire. Now she knows. Where'd you get that key ring? Uh, my dad made it for me. He had one just, your dad? The gunner, any girl. No. The bloke on the bridge with your mom. That was his, I know, shh. If we were wrong, if he was what you first thought, if he was your, not now. You have to. You can. You're made of special stuff. In other words, Edie's not only, what might she also be? 
maker. If you were made by a glint and a maker, I don't know if that's ever happened. You'd be something more special, wouldn't you? We don't know. The gunner's hand went to the scar on his chest, the almost invisible streak of fresh and untarnished bronze, where Edie's hands had smoothed the wound and healed him. He leans in, whispers in her ear. It ain't just the boy who's got maker's hands. What? What did a glint and maker make? Tell him, Edie. Maybe that's why all this happened. Maybe that's why you saw him and ran after him. What's he mean? That he's your half-brother. Maybe this family is supposed to be united in some way. Maybe none of this was ever an accident. Like the Queen said, the world balances accounts. What, what did Glint and Maker make? And Edie pulls out her heart stone. And as her thumb coasted over the familiar sea tumbled line, she felt the heat and pulled it out of her pocket. Blazing light, brighter, more powerful than she'd ever seen. She'd never seen so many kinds of light. Like a rainbow. Edie laughs. And she says, this. They made this. My mom, the glint, and your dad, the maker. We saw them. Before I was born. Before you were born. And they made something. They took this bottle, filled it with hope and love and good stuff. And if you laugh, I will knock your bloody head sideways. They threw it into the river. It washed up on a beach. Later, much later, I found this broken bit of it. It became our heart stone. And what? And if that bloody ice devil is another creature of darkness, then that light is the very weapon we need, said the bulldog. That is Winston Churchill. And if he remains on his high citadel, won't come down to fight, then you will have to go to him up there. So... So we spitfire make. George shows the dragon the little plane. And he's kneading a ball of pure wildfire. George says, like this. Okay. So they make the spitfire. And Page 435, there it stood, a perfect spitfire made from wildfire. They go off to the high citadel, page 439. They run into the Sphinx. <clears throat> I am the Sphinx, the great and mighty enigma of Egypt, growled the giant head on the lion's body. There was a crash and a shudder as something landed right in front of them. The high admiral. Anybody know who this is? Lord Horatio Nelson, who stands on a column, I don't know, 100 feet, 150 feet tall, right at the center of Trafalgar Square in London. He has that plinth, he has that place of honor because he's one of the greatest heroes England has ever known. Okay? Lost his arm in a battle, Kept on fighting. Had him blown off by a cannonball. He kept on fighting. Died at a fairly young age. Okay? At a famous battle. If you visit the HMS Victory, which was his flagship, in Portsmouth Harbor, it was recovered from the harbor 20 or 30, no, longer than that, 30 or 40 years ago, so that now you can walk on it. If you walk about on the HMS Victory and everything, and you go to the place where Nelson died, because he died in his ship after um, the famous battle. You can't take pictures there. It's the one place on the ship they don't allow pictures, because it is, quote, unquote, sacred to the Brits. I mean, he defended England against France in the Napoleonic Wars in the late 1790s, early 1800s, and defeated the French. He's the one who shows up in front of the Sphinx and says, Then this bids fair to be a most unhappy engagement for you, for I am the victor of the Nile. He defeated Napoleon's forces at the Nile. And this square of land is my damned quarterdeck, which is where he died, on his quarterdeck. Okay? Actually, it's where he was hit. He died below decks. Okay? So... 
George and the Ice Devil go at it 440 and 80, 443, 444 and following. And we're told, bottom of 444. George yells to Edie about her sea glass. She picks it out. If it's what Glinton Maker made, we need to see if it does something because I'm out of ideas. She turns and faces it towards the ice devil. The world once more went fast slow as Edie saw the last hope tumble toward the ground and heard the ice devil roar. Why? Because she drops it. There is a flash from behind her as something splashed through the wall of fire and flat past her, a white bird, an owl, gently plucking the tumbling fragment of light from the air and carried it straight toward the ice devil. The same owl that she saw in a dream that saved her at the beach. The ice devil opened his mouth to roar it to smithereens, but the bird flew slowly straight through the middle of his chest, in one side and out the other, carrying her heart stone. Why? Because he was made of nothing. Nothing but ice crystals and the outer darkness and the inhuman terror that has no form in this world. And Edie says, and dressed him. The owl flies on. But it leaves a hole in the middle of the ice devil. The ice melted and the ice devil had no form as it searched blindly for a way to be, shrieking in terror. It found a darkness it recognized and reached for it. The darkness on the other side of the black mirror in George's hand. There was an enormous explosion as loud as worlds came lighting, which in a way they were. The heart stone flashed white as an atomic ground zero. The mirrors leaped in their hands as the ice devil leaves the world. And because the world balances accounts and matches every exit with an entrance, just as the ice devil popped out of this world, in come back comes back a little package. And then they're violently jerked across the tower, each toward the other as mirrors slam together. George looks down at the fragment in his hand, no longer the blackest scene he'd ever seen. He shows it to Edie, she lifts hers, they're not identical, they're white. And the dragon says, good you are both, saved all, all indebted. George looks at her hand, what's that? The stone burned me. She showed him the jagged scar in her hand. He turned his own palm to show the same maker's mark on his palm. Yeah, so there's something I think we need to talk about, she says. Edie, next page, 448. It's all over. George, nope, not quite. Hefting the stone arm. A couple things to do. First, need to put this back in the London stone. Can't do any more harm. And I've got to fix the little dragon. Then it's all over. George, no, then it begins. You think all this was impossible? Try to figure out how we explain you to my mom. How do I explain to my mom I have a half sister? Okay. Because remember what George's father told Edie. I've got to go back to her. Why? Because he impregnated her. No. George's father didn't impregnate. Yeah, she got pregnant, then freaked out, then had an affair. Is it that? Yeah, that's what he said. I um, thought it was the other way around. I'm pretty sure she got pregnant, freaked out, then had an affair. Right here, 272. She's pregnant and it freaked her out. Freaked her out so much she went off and had an affair with someone else. Said so it won't happen again, but. That's right, that's right, okay. Yeah. Um, so. Edie says we don't have to. George, yeah, we do. And we will. She's not entirely normal herself. What do you mean? Nothing, you'll see. Don't be so touchy. I'm not. I'm not some lost puppy that needs a home. He says, no, but you've got one. Okay. So they go back, page 453. The walker shows up. 
and the young soldier says, you know, come to turn a day, old hooky will be get better. The walker, nothing gets better. Not ever, not really, certainly not for any of you. He held Edie tightly around the neck. She's got that blade at her neck. So nearly cutting it that George could see every vein pulse. Edie stood still as a statue. She didn't look scared. She looked angry, but not scared. She's had enough to do with the walker, right? You shouldn't have come. You really shouldn't have come. Not here, not now, says little tragedy. Edie, I did see you. Stupid, of course. Just because the world likes balance doesn't mean that the weights and the counterweights are always good ones. Little Tragedy walked past him, that is George, towards the walker, holding something down by his side, slightly behind his back, something shiny. What's he have? A uh, broken bottle. No, he said, you shouldn't have come here because it's the first place he'd look in it, and now he's got you again, and I'm sorry he got you the first time. This is tragedy, apologizing to Edie, saying, I, <coughs> excuse me, I didn't know, I didn't understand earlier. It was the walker who realized it first. It was the walker who saw that the moisture on the boy's bronze cheekbone was real tears and knew that the catch in the voice was crying. And it was the walker who understood, just fatally, too soon, that little tragedy was going to try to rescue Edie. He tells tragedy to get back, he says no, and he leaps. The shiny thing he'd been holding at his side was a gin bottle he must have taken from the Blackfriars pub. Got his wiry little body between the dagger and Edie. He grabbed the walker's wrist with one hand, keeping the blade away from her, and smashes the other on the walker's head. Says, leave her alone. Almost worked. Little tragedy almost becomes a hero. But the walker hacked tragedy, tragedy's legs from under him with a brutal kick, and as the boy fell, they all saw the speed with which the walker freed his knife hand. Slashed the blade through the falling figure, tragedy, in a movement that was almost balletic in its elegance and power. And before Edie can even move, he's got the knife back at her throat. He says, look, I'm hollow. I knew it ain't. There's no tragedy speaking. Told you I was made wrong. Nothing in there. No heart. Gunner, poor little bugger, had a heart in the end. That is, he tried to do something right. He tried to do something heroic, which is heroic. So the walker says, you're going to do exactly what I tell you, or I cut her open. <coughs> so where's the stone arm? George looks at Edie. She looks at Little Tragedy. She says, it's okay. Whatever you do, it's okay. In other words, it's all going to balance out. You know, it's karma. George, all right. Queen, wait. Gunner, can't trust him. Got a better option. Edie, don't. George turns, walks past the shocked faces of the gunner, the queen, over to the chariot. Reaches the front wall, hoists out a bundle, walks across to the walker. Says, just don't hurt her. Edie, George, don't. Just don't hurt her. Looks like the frightened boy she'd seen from the very beginning. What should this tell her? That he's got a trick up his sleeve. Looked tired and beaten. He looks, in other words, exactly the way the walker wants him to look. Really, there are better ways. Give me the bundle, stop your whining. George straightens up, looks at Edie right in the eye, and says, You know, you never do what anyone tells you. Close your eyes. And she did. The walker laughed. The sudden shriek of terror with which he greeted the contents was cut off as abruptly as it had begun, frozen on snarling lips. Why? Because what is it? It's Medusa. So. Where did George get it? Uh, Perseus is found. So, George closes his eyes. Edie closes her eyes. Edie. It's Medusa, isn't it? Yep. Sphinx told me to remember that riddle. And while the spits watched, they worked quietly together, 459, freeing the sword from the stone, pulling apart the crack wide enough to put the arm in, closed up the crack so that the London stone looked as always had and always would. Okay, they fixed little tragedy. And Edie gave him a heart. 
Notice they didn't see. Because they were not close enough, the gunner, the queen, and others did not see the small shape Edie outlined inside the boy's chest before she and George closed him up. She says, I know, sentimental clap trap. He tried to save me. None of them really got them. It'll mean something to him. Um... Talk about what to do with the tr with the statue of the walker. Let's see here. Page four sixty one. They get to Trafalgar Square, and there's shattered bodies everywhere. Spitz returning for a second load to take them back where they belong, as well as the dead taints. And one thing about Trafalgar Square, it's got these four <coughs> huge plinths. Each one might be a little off on this. About the size of this room, maybe a little bit smaller. Stand, you know, the first level stands like this high. Top level, yeah, probably top level is about this high. And on top of that, on three of them are these huge stone lions. The fourth one, the one, <clears throat> National Gallery of uh, Art is here. Fourth one is over right here, closest to it. Um, they started several years ago, they do this rotating art thing, and they put something else up there for a summer or for a season, etc. Okay? That's where they leave the walker. And Edie says, uh, excuse me, the uh, bulldog. Edie caught George looking from the Walker statue, page 461, in the chariot to the empty plinth on the northwest corner. George, she began, George says, why not? Every victory needs a monument. He'd hate it. Everyone seeing him, scared and beating, beaten. And one thing about the plinths, covered with pigeons. So he's going to be covered with pigeon crap. So, George and Edie start walking down the mall, okay? At Trafalgar Square, you've got Nelson's column here. He's the admiral. Nelson's column here, and you've got like a plinth here, plinth here, plinth here, plinth here. Each of these, if I remember correctly, have um, fountains around them. This is the one they put the walker on, okay? The National Gallery of Art is here. And then you have heading off this direction. You got what's called the Admiralty Arch here. It used to be the Naval Headquarters. And then that develops into, that road develops into Pal Mal. And down here at the end of it, you have Buckingham Palace, okay? Um, St. James Park is over here. Green Park is down here. So they're now walking down the mount towards the area that George's family lived in. Because you have to keep coming down here. You go through Green Park, and George lives over in this area in South Kensington. So they're going back to the Natural History Museum, which is down in this area. George says, I'm going to mend the carving I broke. Then we're going home. George. So much that was impossible at the last sentence. She didn't know where to begin. George says, don't worry. After everything we've done, everything we've seen, everything that's impossible, yeah, it's going to be difficult to explain you to my mom. He looped his arm companionably over her shoulder. She let it ride, and she uh, what's that? My arm. Get used to it. The black mirrors turned white. Yeah, I was thinking about that. The black mirrors led to the outer darkness. What do you think happens if you go through the white mirrors? What is this outer darkness? If you're speaking kind of New Testamental terms, Book of Revelation terms, it's like hell. Okay? Don't know, says Edie. And it seemed the most natural thing in the world when George looked down and saw that she had snaked her arm easily around his waist. 
The gunner grinned, stole a look at the queen. She raises an eyebrow, the merest hint of an answering smile, twitching the side of her mouth before she got it under control. As they all walked together into the bustling life and color that was returning to warm the stone heart of the city. Why? Because the city's made of stone. The heart of, city, of the city is the Royal Mile. It's the center of London itself. It's the Roman part, original part of London. Okay? The reason the gunner and the queen are with them is why? Well, they got to come down here, and I said, you know, there's Green Park is over here, okay? Piccadilly runs like this. Piccadilly runs like this, and then you have this road that comes, empties into Piccadilly, but it also runs around. Over here is Hyde Park, okay? Hyde Park Corner, which is where the gunner needs to go to, okay? Down here, off Exhibition Road is the Science Museum, where George knocked the dragon off. So they're all going back to their respective places. And the city, the next morning, is going to wake up and it'll be like what? Nothing ever happened. Bingo. Because George and Edie go where? They go back to their London. Does that mean they will never... Remember any of this? Because remember, what happens when George makes his sacrifice on the stone heart, which he doesn't actually do? He would forget everything. He would forget everything, but he doesn't do that. He takes the hard way. So is George going to remember everything? Probably. Will Edie remember everything? Most likely. Yeah. Will they be able to see taints and spits in the future? We have no idea. We'll stop there. Um, the exam, if you haven't noticed, I posted the exam on D2L uh, under the announcements tab, and I also emailed it via D2L. So it's in your D2L slash eLearn uh, email. It's due Monday, Monday at noon, I believe, either in my box, across the hallway, uh, in the box of my door, we're in my mail slot in the English department mail room. Thank you all very much. Have a good winter break. Thank you, too. Thank you, too. Can we bring the exam before Monday? Or yeah. Okay. If I'm not here, just put it in one of those boxes. Put right. it in the box on my door. All right. Okay. Yep. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you too.